So my talk is called Having an Effect, and my name is Mass. I'm a software engineer from Copenhagen, Denmark, where I work at a small startup called Family. And at Family, we write a bunch of services in Scala, and we tend to use these techniques that I'm going to show today. So the talk is called Having an Effect, and that means we're going to talk about effects and functional programming, uh, which turns out to be a huge topic. So I had to narrow down the scope a bit for this talk. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to show how to deal with side effects in functional programs, or more precisely, I'm going to show how to deal with some of the problems that arise when you try to deal with side effects in functional programming. Um, I'm going to talk about monad transformers, free monads, and tagless final. Um, and I will focus on how to use these techniques in your programs rather than how they are implemented kind of under the hood. There are a few places where we will kind of look under the hood and see how these techniques are implemented. Um, and that's because I believe it will help you kind of use them in your programs uh, when you have a deeper understanding of them. There's also a bunch of stuff that I won't be able to cover in this talk. Um, and the first is that this won't be an introduction to functional programming. So I'm going to expect that you kind of know what functional programming is um, and that you're already kind of indoctrinated into that kind of way of thinking. Um, and this also won't be an introduction to monads. So I'm going to assume that you kind of read about them or use them a little bit in your programs. Um, otherwise, this talk would be <laughs> way too long, I think. So the talk is separated into two parts. Um, and the first part is going to be about monad transformers, and the second part is going to be about tagless final and free monads, as they are kind of kind of similar. So first, monad transformers. And you can't really talk about monad transformers without talking a little bit about monads. So I think the best uh, description I found is this very short quote from Scala with Cats, uh, which is a very nice book. And it says, a monad is a mechanism for sequencing computations. And in Scala, that would look something like this. So you sequence a few computations. The first one uh, asks for a user, uh, given some username. And then once it has a user, it asks some service to get some value out. Once it has that, it can finally compute some value. So each of these uh, steps in the in this sequence, they can return an optional value. So the user might not be in the database, or the service might not be able to compute this value. So in this case, we're using monads. Uh, sorry, we're using monads to sequence computations in a context of optional values. And there, are, there is the option monad, the either monad, the list monad, the IO monad, the state monad, the reader monad, the writer monad, the IO monad, the ID monad, the validate monad, the evil monad, the contention monad, and you have all of these wonderful monads uh, and a bunch more and a ton I probably never even heard of. Um, so once you have all of these monads, you get into a problem that's described quite nicely in a, in a book called Real, Real World Haskell, and it says, Monads provide a powerful way to build computations with effects. Each of the standard monads is specialized to do exactly one thing. In real code, we often need to, uh, we need to be able to use several effects at once. So what that's kind of trying to get at in this case is that you could imagine you have a program that it goes to uh, a data, it asks for a username, goes to a database, and then based on the user, it gets the user's email. Um, and in that case, in Scala, we would start with a for comprehension. And then we would ask the prompt, so as a user, to type in some kind of username. And then given the username, we would uh, ask this user service to find it. Um, and you can see here that we're in the context of I.O. And that's because we're doing input-output to read from the terminal. And then once we have the username, uh, we go to a service, uh, so that's I.O. again. But maybe we can't connect to the service and it will fail. So for that, we use either monad. And even if it can connect to the monad, the user might not be there, so it's an optional user. So what you end out with is an I.O. of either of option of a user, which means that if you want to do something with the user, then you're going to have to map over the either to get the option user, then map over that to get the user's email, then you're done. So we started out with a really pretty sequencing of operations, and then we end out with a, like a nested map in the end, which isn't very nice. So what we would prefer to do instead is just to say, give me the username, give me the user, return the user's email. But we can't do that because uh, that would require all of this to be one single monad for the flat map operations to kind of align. But being functional programmers, we think, okay, so we have monads. 
can be just to write a method that takes two monads, smacks them together, and gives us a combined monad, and that would be the monad we use in this context. So let's try to do that. So we want to, and this example is again from this very nice book, Scala with Cats. We want to write a method that composes two monads. So in Scala, this is a method with two type parameters that are higher kind of types, and they have the ex uh, implicit restriction that these types should be monads. Then we want to, uh, then we define a new type M3, and M3 is simply just uh, an alias for M1 wrapping M2 wrapping a value of A. So we de define a monad for this new type, and in a monad you have to implement two methods, pure and flat map. At least that's the name in the Scala world. So pure takes a value of A and has to return the value in the context of this new monad, and that's not so bad. So we have a method called pure, pure that will allow you to kind of lift a value into a monad. So we call that on A to get an M2 of A, and then we call pure on that to get an M1 of M2 of A, and then we're done. So the last one is flat map, and if we kind of look at the kind of the values and the functions that we have at our disposal, then we have an f of A, which is the instance of the monad, and then we have a function from A to M3 of B, and we have to return M3 of B. And we could look at this for quite a while, uh, and I tried to look at it for quite a bit, and we can kind of see the information that we have at, a, at our disposal. We have this M, uh, f A with an M3 of A, and then a function, but we have no way to get into the f of A. And the other methods we have at our at disposal for pure for the two other monads, they won't really help us either. So there's no way that we can write this flat map method um, with the information we have at our disposal at this point, which leaves us with the conclusion that monads don't compose. So you can take two arbitrary monads, put them together, and then get a third monad with the capabilities of the two monads you put together, um, which is sad. But luckily, some people found out that they might not compose in general, but you can take some monads and uh, make sure that they compose, and that's kind of the underlying idea of monad transformers. So for each of these monads that are composable, you write a monad transformer called monad T, so it's option T for option, either T for either, and then you can use these transformers to smack monads together. Um, and this is one of the cases where we're going to quickly look under the hood, uh, because I think it helps understand the concept quite a lot. So we're going to try to do it with option. We want to write one of these transformers for the option monad. So in this case, we define a new uh, case class called option T. It takes two type parameters, F and A, where F is a higher kind of type. And then it just wraps a value of F of option of, of A. So what it's doing here is simply just saying, OK, you can take any higher kind of type and wrap it around an option. And then we want to define a monad instance for that. And the way we do that is that uh, we say to the Scala compiler, given some higher kind of type f, if you know that f is a monad, then we can uh, define a new monad uh, for option t uh, with this specific f. And then there's a question mark, and that's because we're using this plugin called kind projector that will allow you to partially apply uh, types. So the problem is that monad takes a single type parameter, option T takes two, so we fix the F and leave the A uh, open. All right, so for pure, it's, uh, it's quite simple. If we read it from the inside, you have a sum of A that gives you an option of A, then you use F.pure to get an F of option of A, and then you wrap it in option T and you're done. And for flat map, um, we want to return an option T, and then, because at, so we have an option T value, but we can use the value property of option T to kind of get the inner monad of type F. And then we use f.flatmap to kind of uh, access the value inside of that, which we know is an option. And then we can just pattern match and do the right thing. And we're done. So in this case, even though monads don't compose in general, you can write a transformer that says, OK, the option monad can be composed by being wrapped in any other outside monad. And then you do this for all of the relevant monads, or well, you don't, the library authors do, and then you can use them in your program. And then the whole idea is that you combine these monad transformers together to get a single monad with the capabilities that you want. Um, so when you use it in your programs, there's kind of three steps you have to go through. The first one is you, you look at the program and the different kind of capabilities you want. Do you want to be able to do I.O.? Do you want to have optional values? 
you want to deal with failures and stuff like that. Then you write a stack that comp encompasses these monads. And then in all of your values, you kind of build instances of this stack. And then when you run it, you unwrap it again. Um, and I'll, I'll show some examples of how you would use it. So first, uh, we'll write, let's imagine we write a little CLI program. So it's going to read standard in and write to standard out. It's going to accumulate some logging for debug purposes. And it's going to depend on some kind of configuration. So for this, we use the reader T monad to uh, wrap reader around another monad. And then we use writer T to wrap writer around another monad. And then the inner monad is IO. So this gives us a single monad called stack that we can use to uh, get the effects of the reader monad, the writer monad, and the IO monad. And then we go on and write our program. So we have some kind of config option that uh, has a method get, and it gets a config in the context of your stack. Same with logging, uh, a single method debug that takes a string and then returns a, a stack of units, so it's purely side effecting. And for the prompt, we can read some values to get a string from the user, or we can write to standard out. So you can see that now the return type of all of our methods are kind of in the context of this stacked uh, monad. And then once we have this defined, we can then use a single fork comprehension and use the capabilities of all of these monads together in a single single nice uh, sequence of steps. So it will look like this. Just read something, read a command from the user, do some debug logging, pattern match on the command, do some further computations, and you're done. And then we yield unit because we don't have any return value. So I showed you kind of the how to uh, create the stack and how to compose your programs, but I haven't shown you yes, uh, yet what it looks like when you actually use this thing, um, which unfortunately isn't isn't super nice in my opinion. So you have something called, uh, so let's, we want to implement this get, and it uses the reader monad to kind of uh, get, get a hold of a configuration, and then we lift that up into IO, and we lift that IO up into reader, and then wrap it in reader T, which gives us a nicely stacked monad. But it is a bit unfortunate that we have to do all of this lifting. And the same for locking. We get the configuration, and then if the configuration has verbose logging enabled, we, do, we write a lock line, lift it into the stack monad. If not, we don't do anything and lift that into the stack monad. And finally, for the prompt, it would be a similar thing. We, we use read line to read some input, wrap it in I.O., lift it into writer, lift it into reader, and we're done. All right. And then finally, once you have your program, then you can kind of run it. And this is where we do the unwrapping of the values. You run the program, that's the method on the reader monad. Then you run it again, that's the method on the writer. And then you uh, kind of execute the I.O. using unsafe run sync, which gives us then the lines that we've been locking and the output, which is unit, so we just throw it away. So in this case, uh, we kind of wrapped it all uh, during a computation, so now we're unpacking it again to get the values in the monads we care about. So the cool thing about this approach is that you can take any different kind of monads that you care about, mix them together, which gives you a context uh, that ha encompasses all the features of these monads, and you can kind of mix and match them any way you want. I think the disadvantage is that it's quite a lot of wrapping and unwrapping of values, um, which doesn't look so nice in your programs. So that was the first thing. It was monad transformers. It was a way of dealing with the problem that monads don't compose. Now we'll kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about free monad and tagless final. Um, so the end goal is still the same. We want to be able to write this nice sequencing of steps um, and ha have the capabilities that we want uh, in this for comprehension. But the way you think about it is a bit different. So with monad transformers, you kind of think about all the monads that you want to use, and then you define your stack and lift values into it. In this case, you think about, OK, so what are the components, and what operations should they uh, support? And then you delay the thought of, uh, of monads for a bit. So I'll show the first approach. So these two are similar. Uh, the first approach is tagless final. And the steps that you have to do in this case is that you define a trait, and the trait uh, has some methods, which are the operations that you want to be able to have for that component. Then you write your program mixing in these traits, and finally you write an interpreter for it. 
So it, it's going to look something like this. The first step is to define an algebra, which is this kind of set of operations you wanted this single component to be able to do. So in this case, we say we have a prompt still. Then we define a sealed, uh, sorry, just a trait algebra that takes a higher kind of type f. We don't put any restrictions on this uh, type otherwise. And then we have two methods, read and write, and they return values in the context of this higher kind of type f um, that we don't know anything about yet. And then you could do the same for the config and the same for the logger, and you could imagine all these different kind of components you would have. Then when you want to compose these different algebras, then you, in this case, we say, okay, we have this class CLI, it takes a higher kind of type F, and then we're saying, okay, if you can give me an algebra in the context of this, uh, a logger algebra in the context of this F, and the prompt algebra in the context of this F, and that you can show me that M is a monad, then I can write a main method where I can sequence over all of these different algebras in the same kind of for comprehension. So you end up with an end case that's kind of similar to monad transformers. And then we yield to nothing. All right. So the last part is that we want to write the interpreters. And I think this is the, the cool part about tagless final. So we haven't said anything about how to execute this program yet. So now we say, OK, for the prompt, I can implement uh, the algebra in the context of IO. And then you implement your methods using IO as the target monad. And you can do that for the config as well, where we read some environment variables. And you can do that for the logger as well. Um, and you can uh, imagine having many of these different kinds of interpreters. And then finally, you s if you have all your interpreters, you smack them together, you get your CLI object, and you can run it. So the cool thing about this approach is that um, these interpreters, I, sh I showed you one for I.O., but you could imagine for testing, you wouldn't want to do I.O. So for testing, you write another interpreter, which could use the ID monad or something like that, which means that you don't use any, um, any side effects. So your, your test might be able to run faster. Um, I like the approach because the syntax-wise, it's quite quite light, and also in the set of Scala features that it uses, it was only, I think, higher kind of types, um, traits, and a little bit of implicit par uh, parameters, but that's it, um, which makes it, I think, a bit easier to kind of start uh, with and, and use. So the last one is free monads, and then I'll compare them a bit at the end. Um, so for free monads, the steps are a bit different. Uh, there are still three of them, but instead of defining a trait, you define a set of case classes that represent the operations you want, uh, you want to be able to use. And then you lift these case classes into the context of the free monad. And finally, you define an interpreter for these case classes. Um, and again, I'll show you a quick example so you can get a, a feeling for it. So the first step is to define your algebra. Um, in this case, I will only do it for the prompt because I think you, you, uh, you'll get the idea. So we, we create a sale, sealed trait algebra with one type parameter, um, and this is the way you do algebraic data types in Scala. So you have a trait and some case classes that's, uh, that subclass it. Um, so in this case, you can think of the T parameter as the return type of running your operation, and then we have two operations, uh, read and write. Um, and the next step is to then lift these uh, case classes into free uh, with a little bit of extra uh, detail is that we have to use a I'll show you, we have to use a type class that's called inject um, and the reason we do this is that later when we have to compose our program we're going to use all of these small algebras that we've defined so we have to tell the Scala compiler how it can take these algebras and merge them together and for that we use this type class called uh, inject and it says, so we say, uh, given a higher kind of type f, if the Scala compiler can show how to inject the algebra into this other higher kind of type f, then I can implement these two methods that lift our constructors into free. And then we make it available as an implicit. And then in the end, we write our interpreter. And um, this interpreter is written uh, using this little squiggly arrow, which is, a, is called a natural transformation. And it's, it's basically just taking two higher kind of types, and then it's a total function mapping one into the other. And uh, the way we implement it is that we say, if you give us, give us a value fa, uh, which has the type algebra of a, then we uh, can give you an io of a. 
And it's a simple pattern matching on this ADT we defined and just mapping it over into IO. So you do this again for all of your components. You think about the algebra you want to expose, and then you do some, uh, write some uh, relevant interpreters for it. Then when we have to uh, kind of compose them together, then uh, our program is not going to be just one algebra. It's going to be three in our case. So we have to declare some types. And I wanted to do this in a sim single um, type declaration using kind projector, but the Scala compiler got mad at me. Um, so I had to split it into two. But the first one says uh, we have a type program, and it's either k, it uses this either k, which is like either, but for higher kind of types. And then it says um, it's either going to use the prompt algebra or the logger algebra, and it's going to uh, return a value of a. And then we say, OK, we want to mix in yet another language. So we say, OK, it's either the config algebra or the program al algebra we just defined. So you can imagine we're kind of consing all the algebras together. Now that we have the algebra we want to use for our entire program, then we can just write it, but with a bunch of impl implicit parameters. So we are saying to Scala, OK, if you can give us the logger, the prompt, and the config algebra uh, injected into this uh, union algebra of program with config, then I can give you a free value uh, of this algebra. And then we can write a for comprehension and do as we've done in all the other cases. All right, and then finally, we want to run our program, but we have interpreters for each of the small programs. We don't have an interpreter for the new uh, union algebra. So we have to do that. Logically, uh, it's just we have this OR method that we can use to compose interpreters, and that gives us a final interpreter from program with config into IO. And then we can execute it. So program is an instance of free. Free has a, m a method called foldmap, and we just give that the interpreter, and then we get out the IO, and we can run it. So I think the advantages of this approach is, is similar to tagless final, is that you can write these different interpreters depending on the context that you're in, uh, which I think is super powerful. Then it's also easy to write optimizers. So this is uh, now that you have all of the operations that your program is going to do represented as case classes. Um, then you can imagine just doing a, like a pass over all the operations, and then if there's some duplicates, throw them away, or if you can merge some. Um, so in that way, you can write a little optimizer for your own programs. Um, and then it's uh, stack safe, meaning that no matter how many nested layers of flat map you're going to end up with, it's never going to return a stack overflow, um, which is not guaranteed with tagless final. Uh, in tagless final, it depends on kind of the target monad if you get stack safe or not. So I think after uh, I looked at this and wrote this talk, um, I was thinking that tagless final and free monads, they look super similar to monad transformers in the end result. We, are, we, are, we can kind of take all of these different uh, operations and mix them together in a nice for comprehension. So, so could we just use tagless final and free monads uh, instead of monad transformers? And I think my conclusion is no. They are <coughs> luckily two different uh, solutions to two different problems. So the reason they look so similar in this case is that I cheated a little bit, and I, uh, in our interpreters, we had the target monad of IO. So we were only allowed to do IO in our interpreter, where um, if we needed to use the writer or the reader monad, then the interpreter monad would be a stacked monad, and we were back to using monad transformers. Um, but I think they complement each other really well in that with um, monad transformers, you're allowed to compose monads if you need the different capabilities. With free and tagless final, um, you kind of think about your, the operations of your program and you write it without deciding on a monad, and then you can pick a monad later, which makes stuff like testing and things like that way easier. So I think the main kind of three takeaways that you should uh, take with you when you leave for lunch is that um, you can use monad transformers to compose monads if you need uh, the different capabilities. And you can use free monads and tagless final to make it possible to write your programs without specifying which monad to use till the very end when you actually write your interpreters. Yeah, and then monad transformers uh, and tagless final complement each other. It's not uh, three solutions to the same thing. All right, thank you.